This interview is part of the History Heard project. The content of this interview may be used for historical research. However, no part of the video itself may be reproduced without the express written permission of an authorized representative of History Heard. Today is August 5th, 2012 at 2 p.m. This is an interview with Mr. Thomas Sarnoff in Los Angeles, California. He was born on February 23rd, 1927 in New York City, New York. Mr. Sarnoff has been involved in numerous aspects of the television business, including not only running the West Coast operations of NBC, but also serving in such prominent positions as Chairman of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Chairman of the Television Academy Past Presidents Council, and Chairman of the Television Academy Foundation. He is currently Founder and President of Sarnoff Inter Entertainment Corporation. Sir, the name Sarnoff is virtually synonymous with television. Your father, David Sarnoff, has been called the father of television. Would you mind telling us about him and your family's role in the development of the industry? Well, my father, as you say, was known as, as the father of radio and television. That's what he's famous for. He's not famous for being my father. He's f famous for being the, the father of television. Back when he was a very young uh, man working for the Marconi Company in 1916, he wrote a memo to the he head of the company who, with whom he was, became very friendly, Mark, Marconi, who developed or created the, the first electronic means of communication suggesting that they make what he called a radio music box. And that subsequently became radio as we know it now. The Marconi Company was taken over by RCA. RCA at that time had ironically was a part of the General Electric. And the uh, Justice Department of the United States broke up General Electric on the basis of it being a monopoly and part of it that was spun off was RCA which was the radio part. Ironically several years ago RCA again became part of General Electric and now it doesn't really exist. But anyway uh, my father rose up through the ranks uh, quite a bit at General Electric and in 1923 he wrote a memo to the board of uh, General Electric of RCA uh, suggesting that radio be expanded into something called television so that there could be pictures as well as radio and that stimulated the creation of television as we know it today. Uh, RCA spent a lot of money in the development of television. Actually the development of black and white television they spent about 50 million dollars which is peanuts today but it was a tremendous amount of money in those days. And in 1939 uh, my father introduced television at the New York World's Fair and that was the first public display of of television. Several years before that in about 1931 and 1932 uh, NBC had built a uh, an experimental studio in their facilities to develop television programming and one day, one night, my father invited a whole group of people from various walks of life, business, uh, finance, government, and so forth to his home where he had a uh, television monitor because there wasn't any television to the, for the public at that time yet. And he told everybody that he's going to show them the first live telecast, a broadcast of television. And I'm told that he had a black 
cloth over the television set and I was about four or five years old at the time but unbeknownst to him but with the collusion of my mother I had been sneaked out of bed and taken over to the NBC studio so after he makes this big speech about what he's going to show everybody and he pulls off the black cloth off the monitor out pops this little boy on the screen and says hello daddy <laughs> <laughs> and he was nearly floored but that was the first live telecast of anything and with all due respect to Milton Berle I have always claimed that I was the first star of live television Absolutely. <laughs> so in 1939 as I say he uh, exposed television to the general public but the war came along and delayed uh, the development of television and the sale of television sets to the public but after the war it, it became a very big thing it was the new a uh, miracle of, uh, our, of the industry and uh, it, 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 was, it was pretty successful with the, the public and during that time RCA developed color television and Whereas they had spent $50 million on black and white, they spent $130 million on the development of color television. Again, peanuts in today's world, but a humongous amount of money in those days. CBS also uh, was developing color television, and they got the FCC to approve their system first but their system was a mechanical system of a spinning wheel RCA's system was an electronic system mm -hmm. which was developed by uh, a Russian named Vladimir Zvorakin who had been hired by my father to develop this for RCA and I remember the demonstration of uh, Color t RCA's color television in Washington DC which I was privileged to go to and it was very successful the color was very successful but the sound was was not and the reason the sound was not successful is that the, what they were demonstrating was a, pro a program of uh, called Kukla Fran and Ollie which was a hand puppet uh, show that was uh, quite popular and the reason the sound wasn't any good was that the boom man was so entranced by the uh, the hand puppet of Kukla mm -hmm. that he followed the hand with the boom instead of leaving it at the mouth of the fellow who was talking but anyway it was very successful and the RCA system was then approved and the CBS system was thrown out and that was the start of uh, really selling television sets to people. This interview is part of the History Heard project. The content of this interview may be used for historical research, however no part of the video itself may be reproduced without the express written permission of an authorized representative of History Heard. Today is August 5th, 2012 at 2 p.m. This is an interview with Mr. Thomas Sarnoff in Los Angeles, California. He was born on February 23rd, 1927 in New York City, New York. The program that was really the most successful at, in selling color television was something that NBC put on called Matinee Theater. Mm -hmm. And Matinee Theater was a dramatic one hour show played five days a week every day each week there was a new show it was just not a lot of scenery it was just props with the dramatic performance by the actors it was uh, something created by a man named Albert McCleary who was the executive producer over several units of 
a matinee theater, and the host was a man named John Conti, who was a very popular singer in those days. And matinee theater, to, to this day, it was the most remarkable feat of production, I think, ever accomplished in television, because we produced five one-hour dramatic shows a week for a hundred thousand dollars a week, which was just simply unheard of. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and we, we did about 600 shows, it lasted about three years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there was no good means of recording mm -hmm. television, the color television those days. We had what was known as the kinescope, uh, but it was very inferior and so we couldn't really re record it, but it was an historic program in the history of development of color television. A few years after that, we produced a very significant program, which was the first program produced in color film, 35 millimeter color film, and it was called Bonanza which was a, a western and Bonanza lasted about 13 or 14 years. It was the most successful program on television in those days and even today it's successful. It plays all over uh, on cable television uh, and people can still watch it but it really sold television sets and with the advent of Bonanza, color television became the standard for all of the, all of the networks. Mm -hmm. And all of this, I'm proud to say, was really the result of my father's thinking and his pressing the people at RCA and NBC to develop these uh, new forms of, of television. That's so cool. That's so interesting. And then um, although your father and oldest brother were senior executives at NBC, you landed your first job in the TV business at ABC. Um, how did it happen that you went to a competitor and network? You've, you've been doing some homework. I did a little homework. <laughs> <laughs> I came out here to the West Coast and went to Stanford mm -hmm. and graduated from Stanford. And then I came down to Los Angeles to see if I could get a job. To be very candid, I went to the head of NBC on the West Coast to be interviewed uh, to see if he would give me a job, just a beginning job. So, for whatever reason, he didn't do it. So I went to ABC and uh, I interviewed the head of ABC out out here. And he gave me a job. It was a very menial job. I was sort of a flunky getting the donuts for the cruise. <laughs> uh, about six months later, by some strange miracle, which I don't say was had any connection to the fact that I didn't get the job, the head of NBC was no longer there. <laughs> and somebody else became the head of NBC. Anyway, it was the best thing I ever did because I was free to really learn and develop without people thinking that I was developing because I, I was who I was. Mm -hmm. And I uh, moved up, I was a floor manager and assistant director and I moved up and I, I formed a partnership with a, a director there who later became my partner in my own company many years later by the name of George Cahan and we produced a show for ABC called Cowboys and Engines which was an hour and a half show on the network, half an hour of which was uh, activities of uh, a young group of young uh, children learning about Western law, plus Indians who 
explained about their history and so forth. And the other hour was an hour of silent Western movies. And our host of that show was a man named Rex Bell. And we didn't realize, and he was a very big star in silent Western movies. We didn't realize how silent he was, however, until we put on the first show. And when he saw the little red light go on the camera, he froze and nothing came out of his mouth. And he was really silent. <laughs> and we were canceled after the first show by our sponsor, Walter Kendall's Five, and by ABC. And I thought that my whole career as a producer was going to be finished before I ever got started. But somehow we prevailed upon ABC and Walla Kendall's Five to let us try once more. We hired a cowboy uh, stuntman who was very articulate and we continued for a year on the air. It was quite successful until, and this you have to remember this was the er very early days of television. Uh, about a year a after we started, the networks made a deal with AFTRA and our Indians who cost fi us five dollars a night went up to hundred and twenty five dollars because that was the AFTRA minimum wow. and that blew our budget completely so we were off <laughs> off the air but it was a tremendous experience. This interview is part of the History Heard project. The content of this interview may be used for historical research. However, no part of the video itself may be reproduced without the express written permission of an authorized representative of History Heard. Today is August 5th, 2012 at 2 p.m. This is an interview with Mr. Thomas Sarnoff in Los Angeles, California. He was born on February 23rd, 1927 in New York City, New York. All together, I was at NBC for about 25 years. Wow. And one of the things that ha happened during my tenure at NBC was uh, the, the establishment of a uh, subsidiary of NBC called NBC Entertainment, which did live productions. And the, the b biggest and most uh, successful of which was Disney on Parade. It was an association with the Disney company doing a live arena show of Disney properties, dancing and all of that. And we toured the whole world and we did several years worth of Disney on Parade. And I was, I was the head of NBC Entertainment and I was responsible for the production and touring of Disney on Parade. And then we did our own show, Peter Pan, which was an arena show of Peter Pan. And after I was there for all those years doing that, uh, I suggested doing an arena show of uh, Hanna-Barbera Hanna characters, uh, the Flintstones and those things. But NBC decided they didn't really want to do that or expand into that area. And I had reached the, head of the top of where I could be at NBC on the West Coast unless I moved back to New York. And I didn't want to do that for several reasons. First of all, my brother was head of the whole of NBC and there really it wouldn't, wouldn't have been, there wasn't any room for both of us. In, in New York, I felt. And also, I didn't want to go back to New York. I had established a life out here with all my friends and the kids were growing up out here and so forth. So I left NBC and I made a deal with Hanna-Barbera to do uh, a touring arena show of the Flintstones. And that started me in a new direction. What do you think about the state of the television business today? Do you think it's, it's in a good place right now? Well, I'll tell you, I have a big problem with television today. I'm glad that my father didn't get to see what some of the programming is today because he would have had a fit. 
but I think television has in large measure fulfilled some of the promise that he anticipated for it because it's been very in instrumental in uh, bringing information to the public, the general public. And when you think of what uh, we can see, like un unfortunately mostly terrible things like well, the war is all over the world, but it brings it right into your room and it makes people, into your living room, it makes people realize more about what's going on in the world. But as far as the program is concerned, I have a terrible time with reality shows, for example. The reason we have a lot of reality shows is because they're a lot cheaper to do than uh, dramatic shows or other kinds of shows. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they're pretty successful, so they'll stay around until something else comes up. But I find them kind of, uh, many of them are kind of disgusting, some of these eating rats and so forth. I don't understand any of that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, the, and the, I don't understand some of the comedy shows anymore, but that's just because I'm an old man now. <laughs> and I used to really like some of the original shows that spent more time on on the writing and the development of the characters. Today, there's just a lot of screaming and a lot of strange things happening. But t television has played such an important role in the education of the public that I have to say that uh, I'm pleased with the overall with the results of television. The fact that I don't understand some of the programming is not television's fault, it's my fault. <laughs>